Um, welcome to Beds, Bugs, and Books, the basics of bed bugs. A very exciting and um, appealing topic in the world of libraries that we all need to know about. Um, I would like to introduce you all to Stu Stasekel, who's a board certified PhD toxicologist, licensed veterinary technician with practical experience as part time special duty forensic canine handler and lead of the Forensic Support Unit of the St. Joseph County Sheriff's Department. Wide, she has a wide ranging experience in academia, public and private, private sections. I'm stumbling, sorry. She's also the author of two technical books, Death, Decomposition, and Detector Dogs, From Science to Scene, and Beds, Bugs, and Breakfast, Dealing with Bed Bugs in the Small Business Setting. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Stu Stangstall. Thanks, thanks, Well. Um, thank you all for joining me today. Um, uh, it's nice to have a crowd in my office at home without having you here. I appreciate that. So what I'm going to ask for is if you have questions, if we can hold them off to the end, that way I can get through the material, but please, please just jot them down. And if you have like a really burning question and your memory is maybe in line like mine is, and you feel you have to burst out, then please send a, a note through chat and um, that will, will uh, help me with that. Um, so without, without much ado, let's go on to the next slide. So what the objectives are is for you to understand a little bit more about the bed bug and the, the genus and species, They're, it's Cymex lectularius, and that is the common bed bug. We are fortunate or unfortunate to have another bed bug. It's, uh, I can't remember the, the species. It's also of, a, it, of the Cymex, it's called the tropical bed bug. And those are found normally in tropical areas. Um, I work with a friend who is in uh, Hawaii and they have both types there. So we're gonna talk a little bit about about the bed bug itself, the life cycle and behavior, because it's essential to really understand this in order to figure out how, where they're going to be, how to look for them and all of that. Um, we're touching upon, you know, the impact of a possible infestation, but I assume that most of you probably know that. The vulnerabilities, how they can get into a library, how to protect, prevent, mitigate, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about inspections, doing routine, detailed. And I have to you know, be, be forefront here. Um, as Yvette said, I'm a canine handler. I've been, well, let's go to the next slide because that kind of shows it. So in the center, um, you'll see me, I'm a, that's my, my uniform. I'm a special deputy with the St. Joseph County Sheriff's Department. However, that's, that's my, um, that's my, I guess I'd say my terminal occupation or vocation. Um, I spent 20 years at Michigan State University in the College of Veterinary Medicine, 10 of those years on faculty, um, teaching in primarily the vet tech program. Um, after that, I left and I went into the private sector and became a um, environmental scientist and researcher working for a pharmaceutical company and that was to pay off my student loans, basically. But through all those years, I've always had dogs and I've always worked with dogs, but more in a, this is my pet, let's do obedience, hey, let's do agility. And it was when I got the dog who's up in the upper, would be the upper left corner, the little dog, that is, um, she, She's been gone for a few years now, but she was my, she's a miniature wire haired dachshund, and she was my first introduction for some reason, I'm not sure how, but we ended up working in law enforcement, and I had trained her to be a human remains detector dog or cadaver dog, and so she worked for the department for uh, 12 years and, um, and worked on a lot of cases. Then I was joined by the dog on the right side, that is Buzz. Buzz came from a special breeding program. He was bred to use his nose. And you can see his department photo, but you can also see um, he was, again, a water, um, 
water recovery dog, or he found drowning victims um, using his nose. He also, in the lower right picture, I think is my favorite picture of the two of us. And it's small, but you can see we were working um, a rubble pile in uh, uh, New York City. That was in training, but he was certified as a FEMA type one advanced disaster recovery dog. Then you'll see in the, and you'll, let's, let's just go on to the next slide. You'll see her. So here's a picture of everyone. Um, I, I worked for the department as a volunteer for 20 uh, or 14, 15 years. And then when I retired, I took over the crime lab, always handling dogs for the department. Um, if you look at the uh, Springer Spaniel in the lower center, that's Maple. We'll talk about her a little bit later on, but um, she is my bed bug detector dog. And then the dog next to her, the little dude wearing the bow tie, um, he is uh, Sheriff Woody. He is uh, another miniature wire haired dachshund and I've trained him to find bugs also. He goes into the small places. So when we talk about bugs, we're talking about the common bed bug, as I mentioned. They're an insect. Like insects, they have um, six legs, they have a hard shell. These guys are visible. A lot of people think that they're so small you can't see them, but the adults, in fact, are actually about the side of an apple seed, um, about a quarter of an inch long. And what I want you to note, there is the anatomy um, uh, drawing diagram of them, but the big thing to note about them is they have what's called vestigial wing pads. The key is they don't have wings. They cannot fly. And so they depend on other ways to move from place to place. They also don't have sticky feet. Um, I spent a fair amount of time working um, in entomology, which is the study of bugs and insects and creepy crawlies and stuff. And unlike the um, the cockroach, which can climb up surfaces, um, they bed bugs have a hard time doing that. If it's a smooth surface like a bathtub or glass or something like that, they cannot climb up them. So their life cycle is pretty, um, pretty much the same as a lot of insects. Um, if you look at the photo, the white um, capsule-looking things, those are eggs and they, the eggs are laid, and then once the egg hatches, and I'll show you a diagram on the next slide, um, once the egg hatches, that baby bed bug or nymph will go through five stages until it becomes an adult. The females, obviously, they lay eggs after mating. They must mate every five to seven weeks, and then they'll crawl off and they will um, lay eggs. They lay eggs preferably in cracks and crevices, and remember this because we'll, we'll visit this back when we start talking about books. The other thing that they do is they, they have kind of a cement, not, not technically <laughs> cement, but what they'll do is they'll stick these um, eggs in places, and, and by doing that, if you picked a book up which had eggs in it and you shook the book, the eggs probably wouldn't fall out because they're stuck in place. The females can lay one to five eggs a day and they'll lay a total of two to 500 eggs in a lifetime. So as I mentioned, they, they go through simple metamorphosis and that's as technical as we'll get. But each stage, if you look on the right side, um, you'll see, and these are not um, drawn to scale, although there was, we attempted that, but, but you'll see first, second, third, fourth, fifth stages, and then you'll see the adult male, and that's actually the adult female. But what is imperative that you remember is that they can go from an egg to egg, so an egg hatching to laying an egg in five weeks with prime conditions. And for a bed bug, that would be about 80 degrees Fahrenheit and moderate um, relative humidity. Adults can live over a year with moderate temperatures, 50 to 60 degrees and actually less. And we'll talk about 
how they can do that in just a minute. But while we have the slide up, I'd like you to look at each of those stages. So we have the first stage. The other thing that really is critical to understand is these bugs cannot develop. They can't move from one stage to the next unless they have a meal. And so when we talk about that, they feed on blood. That is it. They're kind of like, you know, I'm kind of loosely comparing them to mosquitoes. That is it. They live on blood and they are designed to live on human blood. If they were really, really, really hungry, they may feed on um, other mammals around, but they'll do whatever they can to seek out humans. So as I mentioned, they must eat at every stage of life to go on to the next. So if a um, bed bug girl, if she laid a couple of eggs and that uh, in a book, we'll, we'll just say in a book, the book is returned, it sits on the shelf and nobody happens to walk by that that egg will probably have hatch but if there's no blood source nearby that they will die at that stage generally they're nocturnal by choice but again they'll feed during the day if necessary if they're desperate enough they will they usually need to eat about every seven days, and this would be um, more pertaining to an adult. And then another take home point, they excrete dark brown feces because this will be something that we'll refer to when, when you're doing inspections. So I have, they must eat every seven days unless they go into diapause and they prefer human blood. So what diapause is, is if, the bug is in, and this would be an adult, um, is in a situation where um, there isn't much of a food source around, and if the temperatures are starting to decline, um, but not be, and we'll talk about how to kill them with temperature in a few minutes, but what they'll do is, if there's not a food source and things start to cool down, what they'll do is they'll hole up someplace and they basically go into, although technically I don't think I can call it that, but they're going to go into like a hibernation. And they'll, they'll shut down, everything will slow down and they'll wait and stay there as the temperatures start. And, and they can do that for a year or longer if they've been fed just before this. And then as temperatures start to uh, warm up, and um, you know they're they're able to you know detect that there are people around a food source they'll start to basically wake up and then be on the move because they're very hungry so they communicate different ways basically they communicate through their sense of smell and their sensory cells for basically their noses are kind of on antenna there's different types of um, chemicals that, that they release, and they're called pheromones. You can see the definition, chemical substance that's released and may affect the behavior or physiology of another animal. So they have a few different types. One is they'll, they'll pump out a smell that says, hey, um, hey, any of you who are out there and uh, you wanna get together, come on over. So that will signal bugs to gather. And then there's another pheromone that they uh, release. It's kind of a fear or alarm thing, and that causes them to scatter. So how, because they don't have wings, how do they get from place to place? And the way that they mainly do that is two different ways. They're described as cryptic hitchhikers. So because they can't fly, they have to basically depend upon their own feet or somebody else's to move from, from one spot to another. So they describe in their behavior two different ways of transport. The first one is passive, and that will be, they will, um, they're holed up in um, uh, between the box spring and a mattress on a bed. And you know, when the person goes to sleep, I mentioned they were nocturnal feeders by choice. Person goes to sleep 
and bug comes out, bite, 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 and goes back down. Well, if they, they, the place that they're staying may be a little bit crowded with other bed bugs. So what they'll do is they'll move to a less crowded place still in the vicinity of the food source, the person. Um, and so they may climb onto uh, the nightstand and into a book. The book can be returned to the library and then when they get to the library they may stay in the book or they may climb out and you will end up having a bug or two um, in the library. They also will climb into luggage, backpacks, that kind of thing. And, and as you're probably well aware there's been you know a huge increase in bed bugs throughout the U.S. and westernized countries. So what, what happened years ago back in um, the 50s and mainly 60s, um, they started using a lot more heavy duty uh, pesticides, DDT, that kind of thing, and really very, very effectively eradicated a lot of the bed bug infestations that you would see in the country. Um, it was interesting, um, having conversations with my dad. Uh, before he passed, he had developed um, dementia and really couldn't remember a lot from his present day, but he sure had a rich um, memory of his childhood. And yeah, they lived with bed bugs. He started describing, you know, like what his mother did to help not really get rid of them, but just kind of keep them in check. And um, they, he talked about one of the neighborhood kids brought bed bugs over to their house. And um, so the other way that they move is active transport. And this is something that presumably in a library setting that you wouldn't have to worry about because hopefully the, the um, uh, motivator behind this is when they basically, the density gets to, to be too many or the food sources move away, but this is what causes bed bugs to literally get on their feet and they'll, they'll climb into electrical outlets and they'll go through walls that way. They can pass from room to room or apartment to apartment. And um, they also will, um, they can move up. They usually go side to side first and then they go up. Um, or you'll also see wandering females um, doing this act of transport. And quite often, if you see a single bed bug, quite often it will be a female. And I'll just the short reason behind this is when you have a, a young female who is not mated yet, um, the males will put out that attractant pheromone and so she'll go oh yay so she'll go over and and um they'll have their bed bug ways well after one time it's it's um they inseminate by something called traumatic penetration that what was originally an attracting pheromone for young female bed bugs becomes something that they don't want to be around and so they actually will march away from from the group and so quite often you'll have a solitary female who climbs into a book or something she is she's climbed in and she is fully fully fertile and what the next step is she'll start laying eggs and then you can have um, an infestation of a solitary uh, you know, female exploding um, over time. So as you know, the risk, um, you know, this is, this is something with my library family and having been a, a user of the library, especially when I was in grad school, um, we know, you know what the, the cost can be. And I like the, the reason I put this on is I, the, you know, the, the bottom lower right, it says it's not a matter of if a facility will get bed bugs, it's a matter of when. And you hear that, that phrase thrown a lot, around a lot, but it, if you have a mobile um, patronage, uh, patrons coming in, 
it, it can happen. So here is um, two things um, that we've seen. Uh, in the, the bed bug infestation in Kalamazoo, it was, uh, they were found at, at two branches. This is from 19, 1913, try again, 2013. And they put in policy places in, in, uh, into play. And then here in 2020, uh, in March, Ypsilanti branched to reopen after closure for bed bug treatment. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the what ifs. So first of all, um, like mosquitoes, um, bed bugs, they inject saliva into the host before drawing blood. And that's because they contain an anesthetic, so you can't feel the bite, but also uh, it has anticoagulant properties, so the blood won't clot and it'll keep going. Generally, what they'll do is they'll feed for um, three to eight minutes. They'll, they'll stick their little nose in and they'll suck blood for 30 seconds to a minute, and then they'll take a few steps and they'll do it again and do it again. Often they're in a, a straight line or clustered. The slide that you see, I got that um, from um, Mayo Foundation for Medical Research. They said I could use that. And they kind of look like little mosquito bites. Um, however, a lot of times people won't even show that much of a response. <laughs> Alternatively, people can develop allergies to these. And the allergies may not take, they may not develop right away, but the bites to actually become visible and itchy and all of that, it can take up to two weeks depending on what type of immune response they have. So um, most of my clients are, are bed and breakfast. I've, I've kind of uh, decided to um, not get involved in the um, private sector uh, because I've spent enough time in the private sector processing crime scenes and that kind of thing. So my interest was mainly serving um, clients who have A, smaller places and that kind of thing, but also who didn't really understand the potential impact of a bed bug infestation or a perceived bed bug infestation. And that's why I wrote the book, it to help with education and preparation because um, they are uh, very much um, a sitting duck waiting for, if you, if you go on the internet and you Google bed bug law, bed bug lawyers, that kind of thing, they pop up and they're, they're kind of the slip and fall attorneys who have moved into the bed bug realm and they'll take cases for free, no charge unless we win, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been very successful at um, getting uh, money from um, hotel chains and that kind of thing. So, and so the issue coming back to that last statement where bites may take up to 14 days to develop, you may have someone say who has been on the road and they've gone from one B&B &B to another and they happen to come into yours or they come into your library. And, and the next day after visiting the library, they develop bed bug bites. And so of course they're going to turn, they're going to come over and say, you have bed bugs, when in fact, maybe you didn't because it can take that time. So how do we see these things? So the main thing, I wanna kind of hit this again and I'll hit it again, is that these guys are the champions of hide and seek. They will burrow deep down into areas that you don't even think that they could possibly fit in, even though they're tiny. But what we're going to do is obviously we're going to look for adult and immature Cymex or bed bugs. Um, because remember each of those life stages, the way that they go with metamorphosis, the way that happens is, if you look in the upper right, those are all actually shed exoskeletons 
or the outside skin, if you will, of bed bugs. There's no bed bugs in those. They're kind of like snakes and other things. So the very teeny tiny one in the center is probably a first stage nymph. The one in the lower uh, left is probably, probably a second or third stage. But you're going to see these these shells and and they end up being kind of translucent kind of a reddish brown and that's what you'll see the other thing we talked about if you look in the lower uh, left corner um you'll see those black stains you'll see the the big bed bugs um you know one out in the center and then you'll see all those dark stains those are feces and if you look at the cluster, I mean, obviously the lower right, that's pretty easy to see and ugh, how terrible. But um, if you look at them, you can see that they're kind of different colors and you can actually see their, um, their GI tract because when they suck blood, that blood actually kind of sits for a long time. And so you can see the different colors that they will um, appear in. So that's what you're going to look like. So the way that I recommend that, that you do this is that you do uh, a routine visual inspection. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that, but basically, you know, obviously you're going to look at all incoming books and we'll, I have, the next slide has pictures, but focusing on looking for those dark um, fecal spots. You may see bugs in the book binding. When you open up the book, you may see eggs glued in there. Um, and they may, they usually will work towards the back, the, the spine of the book, but you'll also see them between pages. So the other thing that you want to do is if you have upholstered furniture, you want to, and, and the next slide I think I have, um, you'll want to really pull those cushions off, get a flashlight and, and stick, I usually use like a putty knife, stick the putty knife in, kind of open up the gaps and just have a, a quick look to see if you can see. Usually if a bed bug, um, if you open up a space where they were hiding in the dark, if you, if there's suddenly a, um, they're hit with light, they'll scurry and they'll scurry pretty quickly. So we'll talk about uh, practices in a minute. So the other thing, so routine visual, this is something you're going to do every time you have books returned. And it's not only, not only consider doing um, it for return books, but if you have donated books and you have book sales and that kind of thing, um, that's what I want you to do. Then you can do a detailed visual inspection and this is something that you know you just kind of spot check um, different shelves you know if you've got a small enough library and enough time I guess you could do everything but this is where you're going to look um, in in the book receiving area you're going to look at shelves and desks and reading areas and again as I mentioned you may want to focus on donating books before putting them in a common area so as this has here, uh, you can see on the arrow, um, that is actually an egg, which is cemented to the um, spine of the book, uh, the back binding. And then on the lower, on the, on the right, that's a bed bug that was squished um, in between a textbook. And um, yeah, that's a pretty good sign. Now it's dead, so is it a problem? If they're all dead, it's not a problem. If you have books returned with dead bugs in them, it's not the you know, most savory thing, but what we're more concerned with is live ones you know, getting carried um, either into your library or out. So there, if you look on the, the left side, you can see the fecal matter, uh, the little dots and that kind of thing. Um, if you look closely right at the center of the book, there's a white egg. Um, the lower uh, stain on that, I, I think it's coffee. That's what it looks like to me. And then again, if you look at the book, oh, Carson City Library. Um, if you look at the book on the right, you'll see one small nymph stage um, 
bed bug, and then you'll see some of the fecal markings. So this is, this is what I want you to remember, is that they live in harborages, and that's where collections of bugs, they will, you know, using the pheromones and all of that, they'll collect together. But basically, because they're, they're very flat, the way that they're built, they can squeeze into tight cracks and crevices that honestly you would never even think to look at. And the picture I took, that was with, actually it was my uh, room key, but I slid it between the um, bed headboard and the side table. And that fit right in there, which means, boy, you could have a whole, whole bunch of uh, bugs in there common places they hide, as I mentioned, are beds or around beds. Uh, mattresses, box springs, headboard, nightstands. They also, because they're the way they are, they also like um, electronic outlets. Like I said, they'll go into the outlet itself. They'll go into charging ports. They'll go into um, computers and um, electronics that are maybe put on the nightstand. Um, I've gotten a lot more particular about when I uh, uh, travel about um, where I put things and where I don't put things. Um, I pretty much don't put anything near the bed. But I also have the advantage of having two bed bug dogs. So if I travel with them, I have them um, inspect the room before I bring anything in. Or if they haven't traveled with me, I take my luggage and I put it in the garage and let them run that so I'm not bringing bugs into the house. So anything near those areas, books, bags, et cetera, can be um, potential places to find bugs. This is what I use for my inspections. Um, I have the uh, magnifying glass so I can see what I'm looking at because there are a lot of little, you know, creepy crawly, beetly kind of things which may not be bed bugs. Um, a good LED flashlight is your best friend. Um, I also will use forceps or tweezers to pick these guys up. An easier way to pick them up, have some scotch tape available. Oh, I guess I'm not supposed to say the brand, but um, let's see, it would be, I just pulled it off my desk, uh, a clear adhesive tape and um, stick the bug to that. A, they can't go any place. And then if you're not sure what it is, you can um, have a pest management professional look at it and identify. The putty knife is for opening up those cracks and crevices. And the screwdriver is because I will um, remove the plates off of electrical outlets and have a peek inside. Of course, I would be remiss at not doing my, as I have on there, my shameless plug um, of using certified detector canine teams for additional inspections. This is to help complement. So basically what I'm trying for, you know, to get the point across is that you're going to look at incoming books. Um, quite often, uh, libraries will have, of course, now with COVID, that kind of throws an interesting clink into everything. And I think the general practice now is the books are returned and you let them sit for, you know, three days or more. Um, and before you do anything, well, that's good for COVID, but for bed bugs, it just gives them an opportunity to move if they're not uh, sealed in some way. So quite often what may be recommended would be to have those books get returned into, you know, for lack of a better term, garbage bags um, and, and then seal them and, and leave them. And, um, uh, one of the, we'll go into tips in just a minute, but um, so what, what I'm trying to get you to think about is that you're going to use basically layers of security, if you will. You're going to do your routine visual inspections, you know, as books comes in, come in and that kind of thing. You're going to keep it confined to an area. I really, and it sounds weird, but I usually will put my luggage and that kind of thing into the bathtub because they can't, technically they shouldn't be able to climb up the sides of the bathtub but also that white background makes them much more visible and then you're going to do your 
and and those are done whenever you need to do them and then what i see a lot of people doing both b and b's and libraries is quarterly or monthly kind of depending on you know your personnel your resources that kind of thing you know take a take a section of shelves and go through them and do um, what I would call a deep inspection pulling things off and you know you're not going to be able to realistically look at every book you know every week or every day but if you can develop a plan that you follow um, that will help you in catching them if they come in and then um, I, I do some libraries, uh, depending on the size, I'll do them twice a year. Uh, one, I do quarterly inspections. Um, and, um, and, and the dog, that will, that will help. Again, the dogs are not 100%, although they're certified annually by North American Canine Pest Inspectors and, and that kind of thing. They have to be able to get to the odor of the bed bugs to be able to get them. And one of the issues that that we have, um, especially um, in infestations, you know, if it's one lone bug and it's in diapause, they don't produce much much odor. The odor I train the dogs on are those pheromones, and um, or if it's on a high shelf, the dogs may not get it. So they're not 100% by any means, but they're just another layer. So this is a picture of um, Maple. We were, that was in training on the left side, we were um, checking a school and, um, and she was going through, they had had some, they were concerned. So we had her go through the kindergarten room and a couple of the other classrooms. The middle picture upper, that's actually in New York. Um, it's part of the New York Metro Transit Authority. That's a train car that they asked if she could go through. We were out there. I was providing training for other handlers. Um, the one in the center lower, um, that's her in a helicopter. But that was at a uh, at the Air Zoo in Kalamazoo. Again, we were just training, and then over to all the way to the right is my my new buddy. Um, his his official name is Sheriff Woody, and um, we were training at Joe Lewis Arena. So, just uh, one other side note. Um, it was interesting as I was kind of stepping away from uh, forensic science and forensic detection and such in uh, 2018, an article came out about the capability of collecting human DNA from bed bugs. And that had done, been done before, but what they actually found out was that um, evidently the um, GI system moves very slowly in bed bugs. And so if a bed bug had had a meal up to three days later and we collected the bug, we could get DNA from whoever they fed off of. And because they don't move um, very rapidly or often, um, that became a, a potential uh, source of physical evidence in um, to match suspects or, or victims to specific locations. And so I'm on a national, um, a federal uh, committee that we, we write and review uh, federal standards for uh, different types of detector dogs. And this has become of quite some interest in the forensic community, especially working in uh, situations of homicide, uh, child abduction, or human trafficking investigations. So, so I thought I was leaving law enforcement, but in fact, um, Maple is works with me, and we don't use her much because, you know, hopefully we don't have those situations very often. But um, she's part of the um, county major crime task force, along with me, and and Woody uh, was recently deputized. So kind of doing two hats with the same dogs. So as far as response, it depends on the size of the infestation. You know, this is, is it localized? Is it one bug or is it the whole place? If it's localized, you can put them in Ziploc bags. Um, we'll talk about temperature in just a minute. 
and, and they can be treated physically or chemically. Chemically would be a pesticide um, application. The downside and the resurgence for bed bug infestations has come across because as I mentioned, we use DDT and that kind of thing to basically eradicate a lot of the uh, infestations in the US. However, with increased international travel um, and those bugs uh, developing resistance to commonly used pesticides, you can blast them with all kinds of things and it may not kill all of them. It may kill 90%, but then you have the 10% who, who are stronger than ever. And then they can also be killed physically. Yeah, you could squish them um, or by temperature. And so cold temperatures, as I mentioned, it has to be really, really, really cold to kill them. Um, a lot of the libraries will uh, put books in Ziploc bags and they'll throw them in the freezer. Well, the key point for that is you want them to be in the freezer for several days to make sure that all the life stages have been killed. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, that cool or coldish temperatures will do it. But again, as I mentioned, those cool temperatures will just cause them to go into diapause and then they'll just hang out forever until things warm up. Heat, that is the thing that kills them. If you look at the table, I have temperature 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The time to kill 100% of the adults, one minute and one minute for eggs. If you go to 116 degrees, only four degrees actually less than that, less, takes two minutes to kill the adults and it takes 90 minutes to kill the eggs. That, that outer shell is very, very protective for the newborn inside. And if we drop just three degrees more, it takes 90 minutes to kill 100% of the adults and 720 to kill the eggs. And be, be aware that that's not just the ambient temperature. Say you took a book and you, I don't know why, but say you put it in, they do make bed bug ovens, but it's not like a kitchen stove. But if you put a, a backpack with books in it that you thought had bed bugs into one of these heaters, the very, very center has to reach that they recommend 125 to 135 degrees just to make sure, but it the very inside has to get to that, not just the ambient temperature within the oven itself. So thermal radiate, uh, remediation, I know several libraries who have different sizes of these and there's different brands of these ovens. Um, you can see the, the oven itself, that's something you know, they can be small enough just to put, you know, size of a bread box kind of thing, um, all the way to the uh, right side, which they are heating an entire house. And you can imagine how long it takes for that to warm up all, you know, to heat up the whole house to be sufficient to kill bed bugs. And what can happen is during the warm up period, the bed bugs go, ah, it's getting kind of warm in here. I think I'm gonna crawl away. And, and if you're treating say one apartment, they may leave the apartment where they did reside to the next one. And then they go through all the treatment and then they either stay in that other apartment or they come back. So thermal remediation has no residual um, effect. Pesticide, I'm not going to talk about it, kind of goes beyond the scope of this. So the, the big thing is I really want you to think about putting together a plan. And this would be, you know, educating the the plan basically depends on educating your employees, how to do prevention, are there ways that you can prevent them from coming in or that you can um, at least reduce the chance of them coming in. Um, and then inspections and, and all of this, what I really push uh, my clients is this is a written plan and it's plastic, you know, it's, it's um, you know, it changes, it's a living document, but, but that it is, it is documented that you do this if you have 
bugs, there should be a place and plan. And I always highly recommend make sure you have a pest management professional or a company in place before you need them because you can get really smoked on uh, on pricing if if they and I've known this you know for individuals and that kind of thing if they know that uh, you know you need them now so I think it's a great idea to um, communicate with with different um, companies and see who you're comfortable with and see if they understand I have if you look closely on the lower right I have recovery and this is this is where um, this is a, the tough one because especially um, social media that we have today, um, you know, it can, even if it's perceived, it can ruin a business uh, very, very quickly. And I'm sure, and I know that that has happened, uh, patronage will decline for a while um, if, if it hits uh, specific branches. Um, and then, you know, if you're, if you're in the other world, you know, you have to, um, you know, consider, you know, communicating with health officials and that kind of thing. The good thing that I didn't mention, the good thing is, is they cannot transmit uh, communicable diseases. At this point, CDC has said they're a pest. They're not a vector for, um, for disease. So prevention and protection have a policy. You may want to bag books if, if you have an idea that there are um, certain of your patrons who have had issues, you may want to have them put them in Ziploc bags before they return them. Um, overall, it may be easier if you can switch from upholstered to not upholstered furniture because you don't have the, the cozy places for the bugs to hide and look around for potential harborages and minimize those. The ALA has great references on online. Um, the, um, picture on the right that's a PowerPoint presenta presentation. You'll see a lot of the same information, but it's, it's good. And the last thing I'll do is I'll plug, um, if you're interested in this book, um, uh, contact me. If you go onto my website, my son got Cymex.dog for me. What a cool website. Um, uh, it will be $35 plus $5 for shipping and mailing. If you're interested in a copy, just contact me and I'll, I'll sell it for $35 minus the, the shipping and handling. And um, other references in Michigan, we've been blessed with the, um, there is a great publication called the Michigan Manual for the Prevention and Control of Bed Bugs. It's getting a little dated now, but the basic information is there. Uh, that's the, on the left. That's a book I wrote. You won't be interested in that. And then there are, there's a lot of science coming out on all of this. And that is my contact info and um, uh, probably better email sue at cymex.dog because uh, phone, I usually don't answer it. If you want to leave a message, please do. And I think that is it. Are we still connected? Yep. Do we have any <laughs> questions for Sue? If you have any questions for Sue, please feel free to mic up or go ahead and type them in chat. And Yvette, should I stop sharing my screen now? You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Okay. Um, would you advise for libraries to have like the bed bug cookers, just in case? Um, they're expensive-ish. Um, I haven't checked on, on prices. What I have seen is that, and this is more just kind of, you know, people who I know and that kind of thing. Um, it, it's kind of a, you know, for lack of a better thing, it's kind of a, a, a crapshoot. Um, they're expensive. They take a lot of uh, electricity to heat up and everything. So what I've seen some libraries do is they may have, depending on the size of the, um, how many branches and that kind of thing, they may have one at, say, the, the main um, branch. And then if you have books which come in, which you have suspect, 
you'd seal them up and then they would be transported. But the key is make sure they're sealed up um, and, and then transported, treated and returned. Um, so I, I think it really depends on uh, kind of risk benefit, um, you know, what, what your uh, experience has been. Um, and, you know, if there's funding available, I think probably the pooling of resources makes a lot of, um, a lot of sense. I do know um, we, we do a lot of work with Toronto Police, and that was with, with the other dogs doing other things. But I know that their, their um, uh, main branch downtown, they have bed bugs all the time. And it's because they have a large uh, transient population who comes in and spends days, you know, spends their days there. So they have, they have several of them and they big enough that they can take chairs and that kind of thing from the communal sitting area and, um, and heat those. Do we have any more questions for Sue? Wow, everybody fell asleep. We are working on getting a copy of the slides. Sue, I just emailed you for a copy of your slides um, okay. for distribution. <laughs> so okay. um, if you were here today or you registered for this session, you will be sent more information after the session is completed. Right. Um, a few of the pictures, I, I, I'll re, kind of redo it because there are some that I, I yeah, yeah. You of will course. get a slide set with all the pertinent stuff. Absolutely. And I'll be getting, I'll uh, put that together in the next few days and get that to you, Yvette. Okay. That would be wonderful. Cool. Do we have any further questions? All right, then with that, I will say thank you to Sue. If you have any friends that couldn't make it to today's presentation, it will be repeated next Tuesday at the same time. Um, but thank you everyone for attending and I hope everyone has a great week. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.